I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the latest updates from the front lines of the war in Ukraine and Europe, and we speak to foreign correspondent Colin Freeman about his interviews with the head of the Georgian Legion and the Ukrainian singer Svyatoslav Vakarchuk. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 22nd of July, day 149. And today, I'm joined by Assistant Comment Editor Francis Durnley and Foreign Correspondent Colin Freeman. For listeners who missed Dominic Nichols' tactical and strategic analysis, he's currently away, but will be returning to the podcast on Monday with a fascinating week's reporting. I started by asking Francis Sternley for details on Ukrainian exports of grain from its Black Sea ports. Yes, yeah, so thank you, David, and, uh, and welcome back. <laughs> um, yes, so uh, it's been an ongoing theme in the p- previous days of this deal around grain, And we are hearing now that finally a deal has been struck that will reopen Ukraine's Black Sea ports for grain exports. We're hearing this from Turkey, and it's, of course, raising hopes that an international food crisis caused by the invasion could now be eased. Of course, it's been particularly acute in Africa, but it's also having a a big impact on the cost of living crisis around the world. So, as I say, Russia and Ukraine are expected to sign the deal today to resume the exports of Ukrainian grain with Kiev committing to clearing mines from the ports and Moscow promising not to fire on the convoys. This is being agreed by in sort of the arbiters of this are Turkey and the UN. A preliminary agreement was reached during talks in Istanbul last week and is now being put in writing. This is what we're hearing from President Erdogan's office. Under the deal, as I say, Russia is expected to agree not to fire on ships whilst Ukrainian vessels will be dispatched to guard the grain ships sailing in and out of the Black Sea ports, with Turkey reportedly taking the role of a mediator and inspecting the ships upon arrival to alleviate the Russian fears that I've talked about previously on the podcast of weapon smuggling into Ukraine. Now, there's been an interesting response on this from the Ukrainian government and senior advisors to President Zelensky within the last few minutes. Uh, a tweet has been put out uh, by one such figure who goes into a little bit more detail about the Ukrainian perspective on all this. And I quote, Ukraine threatens military response, as it says, grain deal is not you is with UN and not Russia. You the Ukraine does not sign any documents with Russia. We sign an agreement with Turkey and the UN and undertake obligations to them. Russia signs a mirror agreement with Turkey and the UN. No transport escort escort by Russian ships and no presence of Russian representatives in our ports. In case of provocations, an immediate military response. All inspections of transport ships will be carried out by joint groups in waters in the event of such a need. So clearly the Ukrainian ministry here trying to distance themselves from any perspective that this may well be playing to uh, or benefiting the Russians, that they're trying to make it clear that they will they have not been forced into this, that this is uh, a situation where they are going to be monitoring it very closely, that they are not striking deals with Russia directly. Um, and so uh, I think we can measure a slightly um, angry tone maybe in this tweet um, about uh, the, the sort of any accusations that this is this is playing into Russian hands. Uh, But nonetheless, I think we should see this as a positive development in terms of the cost of living impact, which, of course, is is currently putting immense pressure on European governments and in such a way that may well be playing into Putin's hands for the reasons I've talked about previously. But at the same time, as I've spoken about in recent days, this will also play into, I think, a concern that 
Putin is being brought back into the international fold in a way that is damaging for the previously hard line perspective of we must not allow Russia to engage with the wider world, that it needs to become a sort of pariah state. So that is a negative consequence of this. I think the other issue as well, just to raise in, in tandem with that, is this idea as to why an agreement exactly has been reached when, for reasons I've previously talked about, the food crisis really benefits Russia. And I think that we don't yet really know the real reasons why Russia have been willing to do this. I think international pressure will be part of it, but I think that the financial element may well be the key one here, that Russia's as economy obviously is, of course, suffering greatly and it wants to be earning as much money as it can. And this is going to be part of that. But as I say, I think the broader one is this is an attempt by Russia in the same week that Putin, of course, was meeting meeting President Erdogan and meeting the Uranian, Uranian Supreme Leader. It's an attempt to outreach to the wider world. And so I think that's the, the other big motivator here from Putin's perspective. But as I say, I think there'll be some interesting analysis on this question of why a deal has been signed in the coming days. But I don't think it should need to be seen necessarily as a black and white issue of good or bad. I think this is going to be one of those things that's going to need to be dissected very carefully. Thanks, Francis. And just, well, let, let's try and go behind a little bit some of the potential things that Russia is coming up against in the next few weeks. Britain's spy chief has said uh, yes, said yesterday that his view is that Russia's army is nearly exhausted and that Ukraine will have an opportunity to counterattack in the coming weeks. We've spoken about the Ukrainian counterattack uh, for m- months now, um, but the British intelligence seems to, seems now to think that it's it's a possibility. Can you tell us about this? What, what did he say and what, what does this mean for the war? Well, just on the point of the counterattack, I, I agree uh, this has been uh, something that, of course, we've discussed at length and is is a big, I think, the central talking point currently in Europe at the moment is, is a counterattack coming? And if so, when? Some interesting analysis I was reading earlier on from American military strategists talking about what that campaign might look like. And clearly, they believe that one is coming, that there may well be uh, weaponry that's that's sort of being prepared for that. But of course, the huge risk from the Ukrainian perspective is if, if, if a big counterattack is launched that fails or is slow or does not achieve uh, the kind of successes that that perhaps uh, are expected of the Ukrainians given their early successes in the war, that this will play negatively abroad and that will have ramifications for them. But yes, you say you mentioned the Britain spy chief, Richard Moore, who is the head of MI6, making some very interesting remarks on this. And I quote here, our assessment is the Russians will find it increasingly difficult to supply men and material in the next few weeks. They will have to pause in some way, and that will give the Ukrainian opportunities to strike back. Their morale is still high and they are starting to receive increasing amounts of good weaponry. To be honest, it will be an important reminder to the rest of Europe that this is a winnable campaign. Winter is coming and clearly in that atmosphere with all the pressure on gas supplies and all the rest we are in for a tough time. So uh, interesting remarks, I think it's fair to say. And this plays, as I say, into the narrative around the counterattack, but also this narrative of the long term strategic picture for Ukraine in the context of the war, which we've talked about is about this uh, kind of does attritional warfare favor the Ukrainians over the Russians in the long term. And reading between the lines of what um, Richard Moore was saying, I think he seems to suggest that this is sort of attritional style warfare of uh, eroding the Russian capacity to respond militarily is having a a long term impact and that eventually they will reach a stage where they will not be able to perhaps defend territory as effectively and certainly not go on the offensive. But yes, certainly um, an interesting development. There's been some very, and and I think it's just worth pointing out as well, that it used to be highly unusual for the head of MI6 or MI5 to comment on these matters. It's become more common in recent years. And when they do so, it's almost always about Russia and about China. I think this is in part because, of course, they really are trying to urge Western governments, including the British government, as to the urgency of the situation with regard to Western security. And they hope that 
of course it draws headlines when their head of the secret services says anything they're hoping this will raise awareness not only abroad as to the severity of the issue but also to domestic audiences and particularly the british public and the european public so this is quite how serious they think the threat posed by china and russia is in the long term Thanks, Francis. Uh, potentially worth adding that the that MI6's ass- assessment there, I mean, President Volodymyr Zelensky in his in his late night address yesterday, he some seemed relatively confident. You know, he says that Ukraine's military has the potential to make gains on the battlefield, inflict major losses on Russia, uh, adding that you know, the intensity of attacks on the Russians had to be stepped up. Um, alongside that, we've talked a lot about the HIMARS uh, being sent to Ukraine and their impact in the war in the past few weeks. Recently, the head of the United States Air Force has said that uh, Western fighter jets could be sent to Ukraine as well. So it, there's, a, there's a growing sense of, of if it feels from here anyway, of, of, a, of, a, of an early confidence. Um, Colin, you've been in Ukraine recently. Is, is, do you get a sense of that at all? Are, are people talking about the counterattack? And if so, what, what are they saying? They are, yes. Um, certainly, there's a talk of a counterattack down in Kherson. Um, which is in, essentially the, uh, the, the on the southern front, curse on the city on uh, Ukraine's Black Sea coast, which was the first major city to be captured by the Russians and remains the first major city, the, 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 the only major city with a substantial population still there, really, excepting Mariupol, which was pretty much flattened. Uh, it's the only major city with a substantial population effectively living under occupation. So they have been talking about that counteroffensive for some time. Um, that tends to be mainly politicians and military people talking about it. Um, exactly how advanced it is, is hard to say. There is certainly some skirmishing on the outskirts of Kherson, which appears to be part of that counteroffensive. But um, most people seem to think that it's not actually going to start in earnest until possibly August or even later when additional weaponry, the high Mars, the, the big long-range missiles that we hear so much talked about, may finally come uh, be, be available in greater quantities. Thanks, Colin. Um, can I stay with you? So you've been in Ukraine, you're, you're back in London now. Um, one of the big uh, aspects of this conflict has been foreign troops in, in Ukraine. Um, the, you spoke to the head of Ukraine's largest foreign volunteer unit. Uh, this is Mamuka Mamush Lashvili. Can you tell us a little bit about him? What did What did he say? He had a bit of a message for people thinking of of whether they should whether they should come to Ukraine. Yeah. So first of all, just I'll just describe who the Georgian Legion are. I think many people are probably under the impression that there's some bunch of people from America, from the state of Georgia, who've gone out to volunteer. They are not. They are a group of foreign volunteers from the country of Georgia, the Caucasian nation of Georgia, itself an ex-Soviet nation, um, who um, mainly uh, ex-professional soldiers, I think, in the the main. And they have about um, 800 or so volunteers currently serving in Ukraine. They've actually been there since 2014 when... Ukraine's military hostilities first started with Russia. Why are they there? Well, uh, uh, readers with a with a, a reasonable memory will um, remember that um, back in 2008, Georgia had its own um, war with Russia. Um, this was when uh, the, the Georgia likewise has as an area a pro-Russian enclave. Uh, two of them, in fact, one called Abkhazia, one called South Ossetia. And in 2008, um, Russia had invaded both of those um, those areas ostensibly to protect the interests of pro-Russian citizens, even though both uh, territories were recognised as part of Georgia. So you you may hear a familiar ring there. Um, as a result of that um, particular military incursion, when the 2014 um, uh, problem started in Ukraine, the Georgian Legion was founded. It's independent of the Georgian government, as far as I'm aware. And it's run by uh, a fellow called Mamuka uh, Mala... I'm sorry, I don't... I'm going to be honest. I cannot remember how you pronounce his surname. It's Mamulashvili, I think, um, uh, who is about 44. And he uh, fought... Um, not in the war that Georgia fought in 2008, but actually in 1991 um, uh, against uh, um, when when the issue of these separatist republics first flared up. 
and um, uh, he was only 14 then. And his father was a commander in the newly independent Georgian army, um, a, a senior military officer. And when the pro-Russian enclave of Abkhazia first wanted, d d decided to break away at that point, Russian forces backed the pro-Russian enclave and um, Georgian forces then fought quite a, a brutal war with them, about 30,000 people. And um, this, this, this young commander, then a, the, the, uh, then a just 14, and his father both got embroiled in that war. And when I met him in Kiev a few weeks ago, he said that we've been fighting Russian-backed separatist, separatists uh, ever since um, his his take on it was, I've been fighting Russian back separatists for thirty years, and I'm still fighting them now. And what was his message to to foreigners thinking about potentially going going to Ukraine? As you can probably guess, it was don't come unless you've got combat experience, and then even if you do come, don't expect this to be like Iraq or Afghanistan. This is a different sort of war. This is a um, a war with artillery. Uh, you may not ever see another Russian in your gun sights. It's a war where there's um, uh, uh, where whoever has the most missiles is going to set the um, set the agenda for combat. And he also pointed out that this is a war where, um, unlike Russia and Afghanistan, so unlike Iraq and Afghanistan, where British soldiers and American soldiers were were on the more powerful side. This time you're on the weaker side. This time it is Russia that has the advantages in terms of uh, air support and, um, and, and, and the, the, the greater sources of weaponry. So get used to the idea of coming and fighting on what might be the losing side. And can you tell us a little bit about um, where, where he lives? I mean, you saw, you saw an intriguing painting of, of, of London, of, of the Palace of Westminster in, in one of his rooms. Why, why did he have that? Yeah, he he his base is in a in a Kiev of suburb uh, sorry, a suburb of Kiev in a, a disused building. I won't go into too much more detail than that because I was asked not to. Um, and uh, on one of the walls of his of his kind of makeshift office, he has a picture of the Houses of Parliament. And so we were obviously uh, curious as a British newspaper to find out why he had a picture of the Houses of Parliament. Um, he actually said, oh, I've just always fancied going to London as you do to any um, famous city. And uh, I pa I've never actually been there. I painted that picture from memory because I like the look of the building. Um, this was a number of years ago they'd actually painted it. But he said it had taken on a particularly new significance um, since the war in Ukraine, of course, because um, uh, Britain, the British government has been supporting Ukraine um, it, it, with, with weapons and so on. And um, he expressed a particular uh, uh, note of thanks to ev ev everyone in Britain who has been behind that. So just to confirm, he, he painted that himself. I'm just looking at it now. It's it's a very good painting. Um, I would recommend everybody... Wow. I mean, if I would say everybody listening, do go to the Telegraph website, do do look at, do go go to Colin Freeman's name, do look at this article and do scroll down because it's it's an incredibly accomplished painting. Um, gosh. Um, Francis, you've been listening to this. I mean, I've just got one more question. Um, just to zoom out again from from your interviewee, um, do we have a sense of what kind of operations these the, the Foreign Legion is engaged in? He says that they engage in support operations for Ukrainian special forces. Um, so, I, I, according to what he says, I have no way of verifying this independently, but um, they are out there in the thick of it pretty much all over the country. Um, and as I said, that they've been there for about eight years. Um, they have about 800 um, volunteers of their own, I think, primarily from Georgia. And then they also have about 200 international volunteers, although the majority of them, them have uh, fought with the Georgian Legion for um, since, since before this current conflict started. The Georgian Legion did not admit many of the new international volunteers that came, uh, that were invited over by the Kiev government subsequent to the start of the conflict, except apparently in training roles. Uh, and I, I think they possibly made one or two other exceptions. But generally speaking, when this flood of 
I think maybe 20,000 applications from uh, uh, the rest of the world uh, uh, got underway after the, the general invite from the Kiev government. The Georgian Legion decided that they, they, they already had enough people on their hands. And I think they took a few of the new newcomers, but not very many, um, because they said, look, we're already quite involved in 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 fairly serious combat roles and we we're we're not in a position to be able to take people who are perhaps finding their way thank you very much for that colin um francis you've been listening to this do you have any questions for colin about uh, the georgian legion and his interview yes i suppose my first question would just be do you get a sense colin of, of how long they think this war is going to last do you feel that there's a sense that this is going to be something that they are committing to for many years? Or do you think it's still a mentality of, of months as it was perhaps earlier on in the conflict? I asked the commander of the Georgian Legion how long he thought it would last for. And um, I guess like any sensible military commander, he didn't really say. They, they have been here eight years already. So clearly they are in for the long haul. Um, and again, he said it's as practically every commander you speak to here says uh, he said it's, it's a case of when we get an adequate weaponry from uh, the west I, I suppose what you can take from that is well what aren't, what aren't they saying well they're not saying we're gonna um, we're all gonna die or we're gonna get defeated they are kind of saying a, a, a fairly clear set of circumstances if we get the adequate weaponry by which I think they mean the high Mars missiles and other long range missiles we can win this war whereas if you remember maybe at the, towards the beginning of the conflict there was a much much more talk of look we need a, a no fly zone and so on and that was not something that was deemed to be within NATO's gift so um, I mentioned that just to, just to sort of uh, perhaps just to try and stress that, that, that they do seem to think that it's it's a winnable goal. Um, they're not suggesting that this can only be done with much, much more substantial Western help of a sort that the, the West is reluctant to provide. Thanks. And yesterday I spoke to Joe Barnes a little bit about the nature of his work and how he approaches talking to people in Brussels, senior diplomats, etc. Just for the benefit of listeners who who don't know the ins and outs of of journalism and and your sort of previous experience what what's what's your approach for when you go to a country like ukraine what's your philosophy i suppose of of, of speaking to people on the ground i mean try and be open with them of course and the other usual journalistic rules um in the case of the the head of the georgian legion um, he, he, he's, he's something of a Renaissance man in a way, I suppose, as well as painting. Uh, he also speaks very, very fluent English. He's highly educated. English is not the only language he speaks either. Um, so in that sense, it's slightly easier to get a measure of him. Um, I think where you have to be careful is where you're speaking with people through translators. You, 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 it, it, you lose a lot of the... the, the the clues of accent and um, mannerisms and so on and so forth when things go through translation. So um, it's important never to come across, come away feeling too certain of what you've been told, that that is necessarily the ab absolute um, be all and end all of it in a way that you might be able to do sometimes when, you, when you're interviewing people um, in, in the UK or certainly feel more confident of your instinctive judgments. Colin, can I ask you, you've written another um, fascinating article, um, essentially interviewing the Ukrainian Bob Hope. Um, can you tell us about, about this guy uh, and what he does uh, and his performances close to the front line? Yes, this is um, a guy called Sviatoslav Vakochuk, um, who's, um, uh, le who is the leader of a band. I, again, I'm going to mangle this pronunciation. I think it's uh, it, it, well, the the the, um, the the English version of it is Eliza's Ocean. They are um, a rock band. They've been around since 1994. Um, they are roughly speaking a combination of somewhere somewhere between sort of Coldplay meets um, uh, meets the Beatles meets maybe uh, um, Radiohead. Um, very popular, um, probably Ukraine's 
best known band, in fact. And um, Sviatoslav, who's better known as Slava, uh, is is roughly speaking Ukraine's equivalent to say, I don't know, um, uh, um, Bob Geldof or someone like that. So someone who's generally regarded pretty much as, as a good egg. And he's also, though, involved in politics. Um, the, the band played, um, uh, were, were kind of the house band, if you like, for the Orange Revolution in 2004. They used to go down and play to the crowds then when uh, there was the, the, the big demonstrations that toppled a previous pro-Kremlin government. And then they did the same again in 2014. And he also um, uh, debated or considered um, uh, entering politics himself. He did actually set up his own political party, which has about 20 seats in Parliament. And that, when he did that, which was in 2019, it was widely speculated that he would actually run for president himself. He decided not to. He said, I just want to you know, enable other people to go into politics. But apparently some polls said that if he had run, he would have got up to 65% of the vote. So there is a parallel world possibly where rather than facing off against um, President Zelensky, the former comedian turned politician, um, uh, Mr. Putin would be facing off against Slava, the former uh, musician turned politician. Um, uh, so that, that perhaps gives you an idea an indication of just how popular this guy is. And when we were with him, uh, we met him in a cafe up in the eastern Donbass region in the city of Kramatorsk, which is, uh, and, and you could see people, uh, people clearly quite excited, the heads turning at the fact that he was there, even though the city is largely deserted at the moment. Um, so what he, what he's been doing is he's been uh, he signed up for duty. Um, uh, after, when the war began and uh, um, said, look, I'm here, you know, um, ready to uh, lay my life down for the country. Um, but the, the, the his military recruitment office said, yep, yeah, nice of you uh, to volunteer, but we think you'd be better still carrying your guitar rather than your gun. Go around the front lines and um, play some gigs, some impromptu unplugged gigs to raise the morale of the troops. So that's what he's been up to. Um, uh, and that's how we uh, chanced to um, interview him up in the Donbass. He wasn't just playing a normal gig there. That's absolutely fascinating. I mean, it's quite something that, you know, you're talking to him in a cafe in a deserted city, and as you said, sort of people are reacting, heads are turning. Um, what, what, what was he, what was it, how did he come across? What was he like? As you said, this guy could have been the president. What did you make of him? Well, again, he speaks, uh, he's, he's uh, the, the, the comparisons with, say, Chris Martin or Tom York of, Coldplay or Radiohead uh, are not just musical ones or levels of popularity. He's also a very brainy guy. Um, I think both of those guys either went to Oxford or Cambridge or um, were contenders to go. Um, Sviatoslav, he, he did a, uh, Slava did a, a degree in particle physics. He's the son of two prominent Soviet era physicists. He speaks four languages and he also um, won the winning. He was the first person to win the, the kind of final winning question on the Ukrainian answer to who wants to be a millionaire. You know, the, the really, really difficult question at the, right at the end. So he, he's a real brain box as well as a, um, uh, a musician. Um, and he's actually a very nice fellow. As I say, he spoke fluent English. Um, very unaffected. I think he has that reputation. To be honest, I think if he if he if he had a big ego, I don't think he'd have probably had time for the likes of me. Um, and so we spoke to him about what it's been like doing these gigs. Um, uh, you, you you mentioned Bob Hope at the beginning. Just for those of your uh, readers who for our listeners who are not familiar with who Bob Hope is or was, Bob Hope was a comedian and entertainer who toured the troops in Vietnam. Um, and went to some, I think, fairly hairy places, or certainly his gigs were kept top secret to stop the um, Vietnamese forces um, uh, firing missiles when he was playing to the troops at their bases. This is what Sviatoslav has been doing as well, Slava. Um, although it does sound like he's been getting pretty pretty close up. Um, he said that one or two places where he'd played the big missiles, Russian missiles landing just 200 metres away. He, he gets taken up to bases, maybe not right on the front line, but close to the front line, um, a long way further in than I'm normally able to get to. 
um, and uh, he's playing little gigs to guys sitting in trenches and in um, you know um, bunkers dug underground. So I, I think it does sound like it's it's fairly hairy stuff. Uh, most of them are just little unplugged things, just him and his guitar, or as he put it, um, me and my pre nineteen sixty five Bob Dylan phrase. That's amazing. Well, thank you, thank you, Colin, for speaking to him. It sounds fascinating. I'd recommend everybody uh, listening to do go to the Telegraph website to uh, do read the article as well. There's even more in it. Francis, um, any questions from you before we move to our final thoughts? Well, I was just going to comment on uh, listening to to Colin talking about this musician reminded me just of the of the vital role that music has always played in times of war and particularly resistance um, to occupation struck by the comparisons between what Colin was saying there and the band, the plastic people of the universe, which would be familiar to our Czech listeners. Uh, this is the sort of foremost rock band in Prague during the time of the communist occupation there. And they were sort of known for being very nonconformist. And as a result of them being arrested numerous times, this sort of triggered numerous protests, which brought very senior figures together cultural figures in that country who eventually formed the main opposition to the communist rule including the they later president Václav Havel and indeed I think I'm right in saying Václav Havel's at Václav Havel's funeral this sort of alternative rock band Plastic People of the Universe actually played at uh, at that so it just remind it, listening to it just it, you know we often talk in the west about oh, the importance of culture and music but i think you really know its value and really feel it in its value in times of 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 real struggle and i'm sure that's how a lot of people are feeling in ukraine at the moment thank you francis i would just say um if you are ukrainian and listening first of all thank you very much and secondly if you do have examples of the kind of music that people are listening to please do please do send them over we'd, we'd, we'd very much like to hear um well I think that's probably all of our updates. So I'll just ask Francis and Colin for your final thoughts. Um, we're coming up to the weekend. We don't speak again until Monday. Uh, what should our listeners be thinking of um, strategically, tactically over, over the next few days? Where, where are the pinch points? Where are the pressure points? Uh, I'll, I'll go first partly because I, I don't um, really... Uh, now I'm on holiday. <laughs> I'm now back in London. I don't really have much thoughts about the, the strategic pressure points coming up. But um, I would just like to echo what um, Francis was just talking about um, when he was referencing Václav Havel and people like that. And I, I think it's true from all my years of watching countries emerging from dictatorships and totalitarian systems, the ones that tend to have been successful over the years often have their Václav Havel characters, the, the playwrights, the, 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 the people with charisma, educated folk who, who can fit um, into rise to the role of becoming politicians and who can carry nations with them um, in, in, in t through, through, through turbulent times. And I think, uh, and th this is a massive generalisation, but I, I think that's possibly one of the reasons why places like Czechoslovakia, as it was known then, and Poland managed to transit fairly smoothly to, to democracy. Whereas I don't think in places like Ukraine in the early 1990s, immediately after the collapse of communism, you really had people like that. However, in Ukraine now, um, there are a lot of people like that. Smart, educated, politically aware people um, who uh, admittedly also a lot of them speak, speak very good English, so it's easy for them to come across like that. But you've got Zelensky, for example, you've got um, uh, Vitaly Klitschko, the mayor of um, of Kiev. You've got Slava, who I've just mentioned. That there are a lot of very smart people in that country now, um, many of whom have roles in politics or, or or who are closely associated, you know, play play roles as activists and so on. And I think that bodes very well for the the, the the long term strength of their democracy. That they have a lot of good players there. They're not some ossified aging political elite which i think is the problem if you look at the average cabinet meeting in the, in the kremlin these days if i could just re reply to that i think it's, it's really this is a really interesting subject of conversation perhaps one that we should talk about in depth another time because it's absolutely true that culture is at the is the linchpin really for any resistance or or revolution and that's of course is why it's often the target of suppression by those who seek to stop 
said resistance. We've already talked on this podcast about what the Russians have done in those occupied territories, which is attempting to immediately impose Russian on those places, removing statues to cultural figures from Ukraine and replacing them with Russian ones. Signage, I recall a sign went up to Pushkin, replacing a Ukrainian poet. This matters, you know, and, and, and it's seen as being hugely significant. And in the West, particularly, I think, partly in, in, in Britain, we sort of see culture and politics as being very, very separate, um, when actually that is a very unusual um, and and it's more typical that they are actually one and the same. I think in the British example, part of the reason for that is due to our rather complicated history with, um, so I suppose what you'd say is intellectual culture. Um, I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean it in that our politics has always been rooted in a sort of tradition of pragmatism um, ever since the English Civil War. And we've sort of looked to Europe and movements that have been sparked by intellectuals and cultural figures. I'm thinking particularly of the French Revolution in the 18th century, but of course there have been numerous examples in the 20th century. Both fascism and communism are movements born of, of, of intellectual movements and cultural movements first. We've looked at those events and treated them with a deep and profound scepticism, which has, uh, has then meant that our politics is always trying to separate itself from what Europe has done. Um, and, uh, and so it's sort of a, a politics not of ideas, but more of, of, of sort of smooth pragmatism. But as I say, this is a really, really interesting subject of conversation and, and one I'm sure that we will have, have again. But would you, would you like my final thought, uh, David, or do you, want me to, <laughs> do you want that to be mine? <laughs> oh, no, I, I, please, please go, go on. What, what are your final thoughts for our listeners ahead, ahead of the weekend? Well, I just wanted to come back to this issue around energy and and uh, and, and price soaring. Um, obviously, we spoke at length yesterday about the resuming of Nord Stream One, uh, although a much reduced capacity, and the long term picture is certainly not good, for, not least from a German perspective, but also from an Italian one and others that are very reliant on Russian energy. I think we can certainly expect that come winter. Putin will be strangling Europe on energy and this will have big, big ramifications. But I don't want to cover that necessarily again. But I just wanted on this subject to just flag that already we are starting to see big implications. This is no longer hypothetical. And the form in which that's taking is that the lights in have already gone out in a very affluent Bavarian city. Um, they've turned off street lighting as it's facing sort of spiraling energy costs following the invasion. This is in Augsburg. And I don't know, this is something to me symbolic about this idea of, of, of lights going out um, because of war. The most famous remark, of course, here in Britain about the oncoming of the First World War was by the then Foreign Secretary, Edward Gray, who said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We will not see them lit again in our lifetime. And I don't know, it just sort of sometimes the metaphors write themselves and this idea of lamps going out due to, uh, due to the war in Ukraine and the, the, the risks on, on energy and everything else. I don't know, it just it felt si symbolic and significant to me. And I think that this issue around energy is one that we must pay very, very close attention to, not only in the coming days, but in the coming weeks. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly with us by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. And today on Twitter, Gemma Farrell.